Hey guys, welcome to week three of our 72 hours series. Hopefully last week you were able to watch week two. If you weren't, go to our YouTube channel, uh, Stone Ridge Baptist Church, find the students playlist and make sure you check that out as well. In addition to this video, week two of 72 hours, uh, this week is week three. So hopefully you guys are participating along with us, you're keeping up, you're joining us on Sunday for our Zoom meetings, you're watching our videos that are being put out each week. Uh, and all the other resources as well. So let's go ahead and jump into this tonight as we continue on with our series. Uh, we're going to begin with prayer like we normally do on Wednesday night. So a few things that you guys can be praying for at this time in addition to your own prayer requests uh, are of course all the situation taking place around the world and in our country right now with this virus. Uh, we continue to pray for safety uh, for healing, for protection. We continue to pray that in all these things, God's will is done. Uh, and that if this is used to bring someone closer to Him, uh, that that is done as well. So continue to pray over that situation uh, as it continues to, to spread and to take place. Uh, in the life of our church, uh, if you've been looking at our Facebook page, you've seen some of the pictures of uh, work taking place out at the new location. If you haven't, go check those out on the Stone Ridge Baptist Church Facebook page, but that is some great news in this time that progress is being made. Uh, they're putting in some of the stuff needed before they can pour the foundation, so check that out, but continue to be in prayer for that process, uh, especially while things are a little bit complicated right now because of the virus. Uh, so continue to pray for the new building, the new campus as it's being built. Uh, also, Pastor Brett and his family, as they go through this time of transition, uh, he is coming down this weekend to uh, move stuff in, move into his office, uh, move into the place he's going to stay for a while as they hunt for a house. And so uh, be in prayer for him as he transitions into work here at the church and, and moving to a new city. Uh, be in prayer for all of them, for their family, for Pastor Brett, for his wife, uh, Christy, and for their three boys. And so be in prayer for those things. Remember to pray for your one, whoever your one is. Uh, continue to be in prayer for them. Continue to reach out to them, connect with them. Look for opportunities to engage them with the gospel. Even though we can't gather and we can't meet, the Great Commission is still our mission. So continue to be in prayer for your one person, whoever that may be. If you have prayer requests of your own that you would like to communicate to me, please reach out, uh, text me, call me. Whatever you feel most comfortable doing, but I would love to be praying with you for your prayer requests, your needs, concerns, worries, uh, anything that you've got going on in your life right now. I know this is a weird time for everyone. It's a weird time for you. It's a weird time for me. Uh, and so, again, everybody's got different things going on, and I would love to be able to pray with you, with your family for those things. So reach out to me, text me, call me. Uh, and we'll pray together over whatever those things are. So right now, uh, let's join together in prayer. God, we come before you again, praising you for the fact that we can bring our prayers to you, that we know that you hear us, uh, that because of the very things that we're discussing in this series, uh, that we can approach you with confidence and with boldness and without having to go through another man, another high priest. And so, uh, God, we praise you for that, that you hear us when we call. And we come before you with these prayers today. God, you know what they are. Uh, you've heard them already before we even got together. And so we pray that you work your will in these situations. God, we pray for all of the things taking place with this virus right now. Again, we know that you can see a much larger picture than we can see. And so, God, we pray that your will is done, uh, whether that is healing for people or protection for people or, or whether you use this to draw someone closer to you. We pray that your will is done and that you help us to trust you as you work. Uh, God, we pray for our things happening in the life of our church, for our new campus being built, for our new pastor on his way here. Uh, we're so grateful for the things that you're doing, even in the midst of this very odd time, uh, that things are still progressing. And so we pray for those things as they Continue on. We pray for uh, Brett and his family as they transition, as they move to a new city, as they transition into a new church and into a new role. Uh, God, we pray for them. We thank you for them. 
And we know that you've prepared them and us for this moment. Uh, now we just pray that you continue uh, to use us to do your will. And God, we pray for uh, our students. I pray for each of them. And I pray for their ones, those people that they are praying for themselves and reaching out to. Uh, God, I pray that you continue to sustain us in this time when we're separated, that you help us to remain close together, that you help us to continue to focus on you and pursue you, uh, not to get lazy, uh, not to get out of step with you, but God, help us to use this time to focus in on you even more closely. And so God, tonight as we uh, now come to worship you and to study your word, we pray that you would be present. Even though we're in various places, God, we know that you are in all places and so I pray that you would be present with all of us as we study your word, as we worship here, whether we're doing it at the same time or not. So God, be with us and reveal truth to us from your word. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Now again, this is the time on a Wednesday that we would normally worship together in song. So uh, again, same as last week, I want to encourage you to pause this video, to back out of this video, go to our YouTube page. Uh, and find the playlist of our student worship videos on the side there. Uh, and just pick one or two. Pick one or two, maybe three if you want, uh, and play them. Either sing with them or just listen to what's being said, but engage in worship. Uh, don't waste this time, uh, but pick you a couple of songs. There are some in there that are really closely related to the Easter season, uh, but pick your favorites. Pick what, what you feel like you want to hear right now uh, and worship along with it. Sing along or just listen, but allow that worship to engage your head and your heart. Meditate on what you're saying and then let it move you to love God more. So go do that now. Pick a couple of songs. Spend some time in worship. Maybe get your family to join in and then come back and we'll pick back up with our Bible study. All right, guys, so welcome back. If you have a Bible that you're following along in or maybe on your phone, tonight we're in the book of Matthew. The last couple of weeks we've been in Luke. Tonight we're going over to the book of Matthew, uh, to his gospel account. Specifically, we're going to be in chapter 27. Um, we're going to be beginning in verse 15. All right, 27 and verse 15, if you're following along. We'll read that together in just a minute. Uh, quick recap on our series so far. So remember, this is 72 hours covering some of the most important 72 hours in the history of man and the things that took place in that as we lead up to the Easter uh, celebration. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, before we had to uh, break for all of this stuff, uh, remember we covered the uh, Last Supper, the, the meal in the upper room, the observance of the Passover when Jesus kind of reframed the Passover and, and gave it some clarity uh, as far as its meaning that he is the Passover lamb. And so uh, at that point, we said that we were about um, 12 hours in on our 72 hours and uh, on that Thursday night. Uh, so again, we're estimating a lot of these times. Uh, some things we can be precise with, some we're just having to estimate. So we said about 12 hours in for the evening meal, the observance of the Passover there. And then last week, uh, we covered, uh, we said about 18 hours in, when in the middle of the night, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is praying. Uh, he is betrayed by Judas and arrested, uh, taken off to uh, the high priest's house. And so in between last week and what we're covering this week, uh, after Jesus is arrested, he is taken to the house of the high priest. Uh, and there they put on Basically, uh, a fake trial, a sham trial, where they accuse Jesus of things, and they, they have some people come with false accusations. I heard him say this. I saw him do this. Uh, again, this group is just trying to get Jesus out of the picture. Um, they are afraid of him. They, they are envious of him. Uh, and so they just want to get him out of the picture. And so there's this kind of a, a sham trial. Uh, and then what we see is, Scripture tells us that, that as soon as it was day, this is where we're going to pick up here. So as soon as it was day, Friday morning, uh, we'll say uh, 6 a.m., you know, about the time the day is starting. And so we'll say that tonight, or, or to, as we are uh, studying our Scripture, we're about 24 hours in to these 72 hours. So we'll say we're about 24 hours in, uh, and they have to take Jesus to Pilate, who's the Roman governor 
of Judea, of that province, because uh, given that they are occupied and, and kind of governed by Rome, uh, and a few other things, the Jews don't actually have the authority to put Jesus to death. So they take him to the high priest, the Jewish high priest, and they accuse him of these things, and, and, and they convict him of these crimes, but they don't have the authority to actually do anything about it. So they have to take him to Pilate, who is the Roman governor of this area, appointed by the emperor over this area of Judea, uh, and they've got to persuade Pilate to do something about it. So we're only going to look at one very small episode from this uh, whole time that he goes to Pilate, he gets sent to Herod, the, uh, the king, and, and sent back to Pilate. We're only going to look at a little piece here, uh, but all these things take place, we'll say, about 24 hours into our 72-hour period. Uh, and so let's look at our scripture together at this one very important event that takes place in the middle of this uh, trial here with Pilate. So Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew 27, uh, again, beginning in verse 15. And read along with me as it says that at the festival, this is the, the Passover celebration, at the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. So Pilate knows here uh, that, that this is not really an issue that, that deserves punishment. He knows Jesus has been handed over because the uh, chief priests and the rulers are envious of him. And so he offers them this choice. Who will you have me release to you? Barabbas, this notorious prisoner, we'll look at him more in just a minute, or Jesus, who is called Christ. Uh, let's go to continue on in verse 19. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. Uh, we never hear what that dream was. Um, but obviously Pilate's wife had been somehow clued into the fact that Jesus did not deserve punishment. She calls him a righteous man. Verse 20, the chief priest and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? They all answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. Um, we see there Pilate try to kind of absolve himself of the guilt uh, of Jesus' death, but uh, it's not a thing that can be done. He is still active. It is still the Romans who crucify him. So um, a couple of things that we want to look at are here. So uh, a couple of key points I want us to notice, a couple of key facts, and then that will lead us back around to our main point. All right, so let's look at these things uh, quickly and in order. Um, the first thing that we see here is that Jesus is clearly innocent. Now, we know that. We know that Jesus has done no wrong. He's the Son of God. He's the perfect Lamb. Um, but clearly here from the Scripture, Jesus is innocent. Right? If you look at the context surrounding this portion that we read, Pilate tries him. He finds no fault. He sends him to Herod. Herod talks to him. He finds no fault. He sends him back to Pilate, and he still finds no fault. And so we see these, these people determining that Jesus has done no wrong, definitely not anything worth crucifixion, which was death penalty reserved for um, serious criminals as a warning to the others. Uh, and so we see both of these uh, men decide that Jesus has done no wrong. Uh, we see Pilate's wife come and warn him that she has had this dream. And again, we don't know what this dream was. We don't hear anything else about it, but it leads her to go to Pilate and tell him to have nothing to do with this righteous man. 
And so we see the judgment from her that he is righteous. He has done nothing wrong. That she even warns her husband, you need to have nothing to do with this. Uh, we see Pilate offer uh, this, this frankly ridiculous comparison. Who do you want me to release to you? The, the notorious Barabbas or Jesus, who I determined has done nothing wrong. And he offers this choice, Matthew tells us, because he knew that the chief priest and the elders had brought Jesus to him out of envy. Not because he had actually done anything wrong, but because he had offended and angered the wrong people with the message that he came to proclaim. And so uh, Pilate tries, he, he asked them three times, who do you want me to release? Barabbas. Are you sure? Who do you want me to release? Barabbas or Jesus? Maybe y'all aren't thinking about the right Barabbas. This guy or Jesus? And they continue to ask for Barabbas. And so we see from Pilate, we see from Herod, we see from Pilate's wife, and we see from the testimony of all Scripture that Jesus is truly innocent. He has done nothing wrong here. He does not deserve the punishment that he is going to receive. He deserves none of it. Uh, Pilate even tries to have him released, but uh, in the end, Pilate bows to the wishes of the people to prevent a riot from breaking out. Uh, and if you look through history, you'll see that Pilate had already been in some trouble with the emperor before, and so he's kind of on a uh, short leash at this point. And so Pilate uh, kind of gives in to the will of the people in order to avoid a riot and more trouble for himself. So, first thing we have to understand is that Jesus is truly innocent in this situation. The second thing, then, that we have to understand is that Barabbas is truly guilty in this situation. This story with Jesus and Barabbas, it appears in all four of the Gospels. And in each one, we get a description of Barabbas. So in Matthew, Matthew calls him a notorious prisoner. He's well known to the people. Everyone knows who he is and why he is in prison. Uh, in Mark, it tells us, and I'm paraphrasing here, but in Mark, Mark tells us that uh, Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder. And so we get a little bit better picture. Jesus, uh, Jesus Barabbas uh, was a group, part of a group of rebels, and he had committed murder as part of that group of rebels. Uh, Luke says that he was in prison for a rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Uh, and then John calls him a revolutionary. And so we get kind of this picture here uh, of a guy who is probably, probably a revolutionary, a, a rebel um, Jew who uh, had partaken in a rebellion against the Roman occupation and had killed as part of that rebellion. So he is a very notorious prisoner. He has killed men. He is a murderer uh, as part of his revolutionary uh, nationalism for the Jewish state. Uh, and so this is the man that Pilate holds up as the other side of the offer. On one side is Jesus, on the other is Barabbas, the notorious murderer. And so this is the offer that is given, and we see here clearly from the testimony of all four Gospels that Barabbas is clearly guilty. He deserves this punishment that he's been given. He deserves to be in prison. He deserves the punishment that is likely coming for him, which is crucifixion. Uh, this is the kind of guy that Rome would have crucified, a revolutionary, someone who dared to challenge the rule of Rome, someone who had murdered Roman soldiers or citizens. He would have been crucified uh, by the side of the road as a warning to anyone else who might want to try to follow in Barabbas' footsteps. And so he is clearly guilty. And so we have Jesus who is clearly innocent from the testimony of Scripture. And we have Barabbas who is clearly guilty according to the testimony of Scripture. And this is the choice that Pilate offers to the people. Who do you want me to release to you this Passover? Jesus, who I find to be innocent, or Barabbas, who we all know to be guilty? 
who do you want me to release? And that leads us then to really our main point. The third thing I want you to see here, to really our main point of this, this very brief lesson, which is that Jesus knew the punishment that we deserve so that we could know the freedom that he offers Jesus knew the punishment that we deserve so that we could know the freedom that he offers. And so what we see here, uh, again in our scripture, is that the crowd cries out, give us Barabbas. We want you to release Barabbas. Uh, and Pilate asks again, what about Jesus? And they say, no, we want Barabbas. And so finally Pilate does what they ask. And he releases Barabbas to the crowd. And he takes Jesus in for his punishment and his eventual execution. And so what we see here in the scripture then um, is that in this moment, in this example given, Barabbas deserves his punishment. Barabbas deserves his punishment. Like we just said, he's a murderer. He's a revolutionary. Maybe he has some of the right ideas that Rome should not be in power and occupying Israel, but he goes about them the wrong way and he takes human life. And so he deserves the punishment that he has earned. We also then see Jesus does not deserve this punishment, but he takes Barabbas' place, essentially. While Jesus is condemned to punishment and to death, Barabbas, who rightfully deserves it, is allowed to go free to rejoin the crowd. Now, we never hear from Barabbas again. We have no idea what his life afterward looks like. Does he turn over a new leaf? Does he, out of gratitude to Jesus, uh, begin to follow him? Does he uh, go back to his life of insurrection and murder? We don't know. We never hear. But we do know that Jesus is taken away for punishment while Barabbas the murderer is allowed to go free, as though his crime had never happened. And so what we see here is a shadow of what we call the great exchange. This exchange where Jesus is taken and Barabbas is freed is a shadow of what we call the great exchange, of a much greater exchange that took place at the cross. Because again, what we see here is that Barabbas deserved punishment, but Jesus took that punishment instead, while Barabbas is allowed to go free with no consequence for his crime. Likewise, we deserve the punishment and the death that our sin earns us. We deserve every single bit of it. Every one of us is born with a sin nature. It's natural to us, and we sin uh, early, early, early on. We are born sinful. I'll, I'll often illustrate to people like this, and, and you've heard me say if you're one of my students, uh, that no one has to be taught how to sin, right? I have three kids. If you don't know, if you're watching this and you don't know me, I have three kids, and I did not have to teach any of them how to be sinful. They just, they just know. Uh, I never taught them how to lie to me. I never taught them how to disobey me. It just comes naturally to them. And if you have kids or if you've ever been around kids, you know. No one has to teach a little kid how to be sinful. It comes naturally. Well, Scripture tells us that the punishment for our sin is death. The wages of our sin is death. And we know what wages are. Again, it's a paycheck, right? You do your job, you earn your wage. You do this, you earn this. Uh, so I come here and I go to work, and as a result of that work, I earn my wage, my paycheck. Scripture tells us that what our sin earns for us is death. We sin, we earn death, we deserve it. Uh, I've heard sin described as cosmic treason, right? That, that the king of the universe has set forth how we are to live in, in relation to him, and we violate that, and we are traitors against him. It is cosmic treason, and treason has always been punishable by death. So we deserve the death that we earn, right? The wages of our sin is death. Scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 
sin earns death, and we deserve it. But then what we see in the Scripture and in history, in these most important 72 hours, is that Jesus takes on that punishment so that we might have the possibility of knowing freedom from that punishment. Jesus takes on all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our punishment, everything that he experienced, which we'll discuss in more detail next week as we look at the crucifixion. But everything that Jesus suffers in this time, we deserve. We deserve all of the physical punishment. We deserve the mockery from others. We deserve the shame and the embarrassment. We deserve to be cut off from God. We deserve all those things, but Jesus took on all of those things so that we could know the possibility of freedom from them through him. We have the possibility of freedom from eternal death and separation from God because of the fact that Jesus took our place in this great exchange. Just like he took the place of Barabbas. He was taken to punishment. Barabbas was allowed to go free. Jesus took on my punishment, and because of that, because I have placed my faith in him and in the sacrifice that he made, I have been allowed to go free from the consequences of my sin, the eternal consequences of my sin. Now, your sin on earth may still bring natural consequences. That's part of life. But I am allowed to go free from the eternal consequences of my sin, the spiritual death, the separation from God, not because of anything that I've done, but because Jesus took it instead of me. And we have to really come to a place where we understand the magnitude of what we deserve and the magnitude of what he did in taking our place before we really will begin to appreciate who he is and what he's done. We have to get to a place where we understand that. So this again, this is called the Great Exchange. And we see here at the story of Barabbas just a shadow of it, of a much greater exchange that is coming in just a few hours. Just a few hours from now. We are at, we say, 6 a.m. Uh, Mark tells us that the crucifixion began around 9 a.m. And so here, just a few hours before the crucifixion, we see a, a very small shadow of the Great Exchange. These great things that will take place very soon. The Great Exchange, to close here, it's summed up. And again, we're going to cover this in more detail next week, so make sure that you tune in for that video as well. But the Great Exchange is, is really summarized uh, in, in 2 Corinthians. And I have a shirt most of you have seen me wear uh, that says, Jesus in my place, which I call the gospel in four words. Um, and the, the, the reference, the verse under it, is 2 Corinthians 5.21, which reads, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And hopefully you didn't get lost there, so let me read it again. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus knew no sin, and he became our sin. He took on our sin so that through him, we could be given the righteousness that only God can give. This is that great exchange, that Jesus possessed that righteousness. He had what we needed and did not deserve, and he took on what we did deserve so that he could exchange with us. He took our sin. He gave us the righteousness that only God can give if... We place our faith and our trust and our hope in him. We respond to the gospel. So if you are watching, listening, and you recognize, again, that you have never responded to the gospel positively, maybe you've heard it several times and it's just never really clicked with you, and, and maybe it did tonight. I, I pray it did. But if you recognize that you've never responded positively to the gospel, you've never had this exchange take place for you, you know in your heart that you still deserve that punishment for sin. There is no better time than right now for you to place your faith and hope in Christ, for you to surrender your life to him 
and to experience this exchange that we're talking about. You don't have to be at a church for that to happen. You don't have to be with me. You can pray right now for repentance. Uh, you can pray to God and, and confess your sin and repent of it and surrender your life to Christ and place your faith and hope in Him. Uh, you can do that wherever you are right now. If you do, please reach out and let me know. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to follow up with you. Um, but please do that if that's you. And if you have already done that, if you know that you are a believer, then again, like we always say, don't push this stuff to the side. Don't, don't think, oh, I know that story. I know the gospel. I already did that. Check that box off. This is the thing that you should never, ever forget. You should always return to. You should always meditate on this great exchange, the fact that you deserve death, but instead Jesus took it for you and gave you life. Meditate on that fact because it will then inform everything that you do in the service of Christ. It will lead you to love Him more, to serve Him better and more joyfully, to worship Him with gladness if you really understand and meditate on what you have been saved from and what you have been saved to. So make use of that. If you are not a believer, now is the time. If you are, now is the time to meditate on what God has done for you as we lead into the Easter season. Take time to meditate through scripture, through worship, through prayer on what Christ has done for you. I'm going to add in here, uh, like usual, a couple of things for you to respond to. Uh, so please make sure that you do that. And uh, I'm going to pray for us. And I've got a couple more things to cover with you before this video is finished out. So let's pray very briefly. God, we thank you. Uh, for the things that we studied tonight, uh, we praise you for the fact that you came to, to give yourself in place of us. We, we praise you for this great exchange. Uh, God, we thank you for, for the gift of your Son. Uh, we thank you that in your wisdom and in your mercy and in your grace that you established this uh, exchange centuries and thousands of years before it happened. So we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for this time of year in which we remember and we celebrate the things that he has done for us. And we thank you for the gift of eternal life that is offered to us because of your son's sacrifice. So God, help us to remember these things, to meditate on them. Uh, help us to spend time with you while we are isolated and while we have a little more free time maybe than usual. Um, help us to spend our time with you, to worship you, to study your word, to pray to spend time before you in silence and in solitude, uh, just to spend that time growing closer to you and in our pursuit of you and our knowledge of you. God, I pray for each of my students. I uh, pray that you continue to sustain them, that they continue to pursue you as well. Help us to remain connected in this time. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So you should have just seen the questions uh, in response to this week's lesson. Make sure that you respond to those and send them back. So uh, again, I can know that you've engaged with this message and I can engage with your answers. Uh, we can get some discussion going on that. So write them down, take a picture, uh, type them out in your notes app, take a screenshot, video, record yourself answering, give me your thoughts on these questions, uh, and then send those to me so that we can engage together. If you have questions about anything from tonight's message, same thing. Shoot me a text, give me a call, uh, get in touch with me and let's go over those things. Uh, a couple other things I wanna tell you about before we end here very quickly. First is uh, remember that on Sunday nights, we uh, have our Zoom chat, our Zoom message. So whether you've been a part of our Sunday night small group or not, Join us uh, on Sunday nights. We've had a couple the last couple of weeks who are not part of our usual Sunday night crew or, and dive group, but they join us in, in Zoom uh, because now they can. So uh, if you want to be a part of that, I send out uh, those codes just a couple of minutes before 6 o'clock on Sunday night, and I send them to all of the students that I can get in touch with. So be on the lookout for those codes. Uh, just make sure that you're at a computer uh, with a microphone or a camera or that you use your phone either way. And join in with us as we do some Bible study 
uh, where we can look at each other and we can talk to each other. It's a great way for us to stay connected. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, also want to tell you or remind you, if you've already seen, that starting uh, tomorrow, every Thursday, I'm going to have a video series walking us through the book of Philippians. Now, if you're one of our regular Wednesday night students, we just went through Philippians. Uh, but we are going to cover some things in this series that we did not cover in our Wednesday night series. A lot of stuff that we did. Uh, but you can never have too much Bible, right? And, and so tune in. You may learn some stuff you didn't last time or pick up some things that you missed if you missed a Wednesday or so. Uh, tell your friends. Send a link to your friends, to your parents, to whoever. Uh, and this is just another resource for our church to uh, use to continue to grow at this time. Um, if you have not already, I uh, recommend that you watch uh, the hermeneutics videos from Amy, also on our church YouTube channel, um, just uh, to give you some knowledge on how we do book studies like this. Now, if you're part of our Sunday Night Dive group, what we've been doing for the last several weeks, that is hermeneutics. Uh, everything we've been practicing, learning how to uh, observe and interpret and apply the scripture, that's hermeneutics. And so, uh, check those videos out if you have time, and then be on the lookout for that Philippian series coming out every Thursday uh, on our Stone Ridge YouTube page. Last thing, for our students, uh, Amanda and I are working on some ways for us to stay connected and engaged with one another while we cannot meet. We miss you guys. We really do. Uh, we miss being able to see you and sit down and talk with you and come to your games and, and uh, all the things that we're able to normally do, share a meal on Sundays. Uh, and so we're looking for ways to stay engaged. And so here's one of the things that we've come up with that we're going to do. We hope that you guys will join in and participate with us. Um, otherwise, it'll be just me and her, and that'll be kind of boring. Um, but we're going to have a, a team competition. And so we're going to divide you guys up into teams, and we'll text you and let you know who you are. Uh, but basically, there will be all kinds of challenges through the week that you can do while maintaining social distance. Uh, but you can earn points for your team. And so, for example, the first thing that you can do to earn points for your team is respond to the questions in this video. Uh, respond to them fully. Send me your answers. And that is the first way that you can earn a few points for your team, which we'll send out to you in the next day or so. Uh, and so we're going to have all kinds of challenges, photo scavenger hunts, uh, things that we'll do together over Zoom, all kinds of things where you can earn points for your team, whoever that is. Uh, and then there is a reward at the end. So currently, uh, when this is all over and we're able to come out of our, our bunkers and our shelters somewhere down the road, uh, we're going to take a trip down to Surge and Opelika and then out to eat. So just have some fun together, share a meal, take that little trip together. Uh, if your team wins the team challenge for however long we decide it's going to run, your team wins, I will pay your way. So we'll, we'll all take the trip to surge and to go out to eat, but if your team wins, you don't have to pay anything at all. I will pay your way for your surge jump time and for your meal. No, you're not going to be able to order the giant porterhouse steak, uh, but I will pay for your surge trip and for your meal. So um, participate in this again. Not just because of the reward, but because it's another way for us to stay engaged and together at this time. We miss you guys. So we want to engage with you. We want to hear from you. We want to talk with you. We want to have some fun even while we're not together. So we'll be sending you out details on this. But again, the first thing you can do to earn some points for your team is respond to those questions. Every one of you who responds, you earn some points for your team. And then be on the lookout for some more stuff coming soon. We love you guys. We miss you guys. Keep tuning in Wednesdays to our lessons, Thursday to the Philippian series, uh, to all the other things that are coming out that Amy's putting out, that Pastor Brett's going to be putting out soon on our YouTube channel. Tune in, make the most of your time, and we'll see you guys soon.